Put a hand on our shoulder and point us in the right direction. Put our hand on someone's shoulder and let it matter. Amen. Stephen Asma is a professor of philosophy who thinks religion is a good thing. Back in June, he wrote a piece titled, What Religion Gives Us That Science Can't. He begins that article with a personal story. One day, he writes, after pompously lecturing a class of undergraduates about the incoherence of monotheism, I was approached by a shy student. He nervously stuttered through a heartbreaking story, one that slowly unraveled my own convictions and assumptions about religion. Five years ago, the student explained, his older teenage brother was tragically killed. My student, his mother, and his sister were shattered. His mother suffered a mental breakdown soon afterward and would have been institutionalized if not for the fact that she expected to see her deceased son again, to be reunited with him in the afterlife. This is a bolstering belief, writes Asma, along with the church ritual she engaged in afterward. They sustained her, dragged her back from the brink of debilitating sorrow, and gave her the strength to continue raising her other two children. Hearing that story from a tearful student drove the religious skeptic in Stephen Asma to rethink his views, and he began studying the positive effects of religion on the human brain. The human brain, he writes, is a kludge of different operating systems, the ancient reptilian brain responsible for fight or flight instincts, the limbic or mammalian brain responsible for emotions, and the more recently evolved neocortex responsible for rationality. Religion, he says, nourishes the emotional brain because it calms fears, answers to yearnings, and strengthens feelings of loyalty. My claim, he writes, is that religion can provide direct access to this emotional life in ways that science does not. Yes, he admits, science can give us emotional feelings of wonder at the majesty of nature, but there are many forms of human suffering that are beyond reach of any scientific explanation. No amount of scientific explanation or socio-political theorizing is going to console the mother of my student. Bill Nye, the science guy, and Neil deGrasse Tyson will not be much help to her. Religion, he says, is road tested. Religious rituals surround the bereaved person with the most important resource we have, other people. Religious practice, he says, is a form of social interaction that can improve psychological health. When you've lost a loved one, religion provides a therapeutic framework of rituals and beliefs that produce the oxytocin, internal opioids, dopamine, and other positive effects that can help with coping and surviving. These practices, the rituals, devotional activities, songs, prayers, and stories, give us opportunities to express care for each other in grief, providing us with the alleviation of stress and anxiety. Going back to Karl Marx, he says, people have criticized religion as being an opiate. But, he asks, what's so bad about pain relief? <laughs> religion, he concludes, is the most powerful cultural response to the universal emotional life that connects us all. I think Stephen Asma has in inadvertently highlighted one of the key principles of progressive religion and progressive Christianity. And that principle is beliefs take a back seat to effects. Or to put that differently, it's what religion does or provides that matters more than its dogmas. Asma focuses on religion as a refuge and strength and ever-present help in times of trouble, to borrow words from a psalm. But there's another emotional side to religion that we can find everywhere in scripture, another effect, something else it provides, joy. The Greek word for joy appears 59 times in the New Testament. It's on the lips of Jesus. In the writings of St. Paul, Luke writes about the experience of great joy among the early Christians in the book of Acts. Joy is pervasive in the New Testament letters though it is conspicuously absent from the book of Revelation and its talk of the end of the world. 
The word joy appears nearly as many times as the word pray in the New Testament. And it appears more frequently than the word salvation. Joy, write the editors of one lexicon, is the experience of gladness. It's a celebration emotion. The wise men in the Gospels were overwhelmed with joy when they found the star over Bethlehem. The angel proclaimed good news of great joy to the shepherds at the birth of Jesus. The women on Easter Sunday were filled with great joy after peering into the empty tomb. Jesus promised that the joy of his followers would be made complete. The letter of James exhorts readers to consider the trials of life as nothing but joy. And Paul writes in his letters that the kingdom of God is a kingdom of justice and peace and joy. We sing of joy in our hymns, hymns like joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Jesus, thou joy of loving hearts, my soul cries out with a joyful shout, joy to the world, and O oh, love that wilt not let me go, which contains the line, O oh, joy that seekest me through pain, I cannot close my heart to thee. I trace the rainbow through the rain, and feel the promise is not vain, that morn shall tearless be. The word joyful appears on Dr. Gloria Wilcox's feelings wheel. It's one of six main emotions and is part of a family of emotions that include excited, energetic, cheerful, hopeful, creative, optimistic, daring. But joy, says Archbishop Desmond Tutu, is more than just a feeling. It's a certain way of approaching the world, an intentional optimism that becomes for us, he says, a reservoir, an oasis of peace, a pool of serenity that can ripple out to all those around us. Such joy takes courage, writes one poet, courage to will ourselves in faith, to look for the hand of God in our world, a hand at work in spite of the wildfires and the violence, the misfortune and the personal tragedies that might steal our joy. The courage to find joy, to be joyful, cheerful, hopeful, creative, optimistic, daring. Those traits on the feelings wheel. Traits that can ripple outward and impact others, as Desmond Tutu says. Joy. Like the joy of Hannah in today's Old Testament reading. Hannah was a woman without child in a heavily patriarchal ancient world. And yet she sings in a feminist key, in the text we heard a moment ago. She sings a song about reversals. God, sings Hannah, breaks the weapons of the mighty, gives strength to the feeble, sends the full away hungry, and fills the hungry with a feast, makes the poor rich, brings the proud down, and exalts the lowly. Her song of joy appears in 1 Samuel chapter 2, Chapter 1 of 1 Samuel is a good example of why we can't apply everything the Bible says about marriage or sexuality or gender roles or even everything it says about God to our time. In chapter 1 of 1 Samuel, Hannah is an oppressed woman. She's the second of two wives married to a man named Elkanah. Elkanah's first wife had many children, but Hannah had none. Without children, she had no status. For the value of women in the ancient world was often tied to childbearing. And the text shamelessly blames God for Hannah's state. It says, the Lord had closed her womb. In a pre-scientific age, the gods were believed to control life's mysteries, including conception. After spending years praying heartbreaking prayers, begging God to change her state in life, Hannah finally conceived and dedicated her son to God in the temple. Beneath the patriarchal surface of this ancient story, it's polygamy, it's troubling insinuation that God controls conception like a puppeteer. Beneath it all, there is beautiful, courageous, joyful theology. Hannah sings about a God of reversals, a God of surprises who turns the tables, a God who lifts up the lowly, brings the pompous down, 
raises the needy to king's thrones and exalts a humble woman in an androcentric age. This picture of God, a God of surprises, a God who loves all people, especially those who see themselves as lowly or forgotten or unworthy, this picture is everywhere in Scripture. Abraham and Sarah were wilderness wanderers before God made them patriarch and matriarch of Israel. Jacob was a liar and a cheat before God changed his name to Israel and made him the father of a nation. Moses was a terrible public speaker, yet God empowered him to speak truth to power and lead in Exodus. Amos was a humble farmer plowing fields before God turned him into a fiery prophet who railed against corruption and dreamed of justice rolling down like waters. St. Paul beat and jailed followers of Jesus before he became the apostle to the nations and author of half our New Testament. Mary was a humble teenager, but became the mother of Jesus and sang, like Hannah of old, a song of reversals that we call the Magnificat, a song like Hannah's song about the proud being scattered, the powerful being cast down, the humble being lifted up, and the hungry being filled with good things. Such songs and stories of reversal are theological statements about God, a God of surprises who can take life's crosses and turn them into empty tombs, a God whose very nature is love, who loves not just the kings and politicians in high places who the New Testament writer says we should pray for, but a God who is concerned with the tiniest minutia of life, down to the clothes on our back and the food on our tables, a God who feeds birds and adorns flowers, as Jesus says in today's Gospel reading, a God who is especially concerned with the lonely and the lost and the left out, the beaten down and the betrayed, the depressed and the down and out, all those carrying heavy burdens, and the good news repeated in Scripture's many stories and songs, in Hannah's song of joy, is that when we see burdens lifted, and spirits brightened, and conflicts come to an end, and reconciliations happen, and outcasts welcomed, and prodigals embraced, and sins forgiven, and the lost finding a home, and bellies filled, and chains loosened, and debts erased, and the sick made whole, and compassion shown, and evil transformed into good, and love winning instead of hate. When we see these reversals, we see, as the UCC Creed states, the living God at work. And our hearts, as Hannah once sang, can experience joy. Joy in reversal. Like in the story of Mayada Anjari, as told by journalist Julia Moskin, Moskin writes that the Anjari family fled the Syrian civil war and spent three years on the run before landing in the U.S. Last year, as Thanksgiving approached, the school-age Anjari boys had learned about the pilgrims in school, and Mayada Anjari decided to make a Thanksgiving meal. A new friend gave her a turkey from a local halal butcher. And instead of baking the bird, Anjari cut it into pieces, covered it with water, and simmered it into soup with potatoes, carrots, ginger, and cumin. Her family liked it, she said, but it didn't seem very special to her. So this fall, she decided to take a test run, making her first full Thanksgiving feast. Like many people who have recently arrived in America from other countries, she found the Thanksgiving holiday a bit perplexing. The multitude of soft, starchy dishes like mashed potatoes, yam, stuffing, and pie, the sharpness of cranberry sauce, and the sheer size of a turkey. Were the apples really going to be baked with cinnamon spice, she wondered? Why would you roast a bird whole? How would it get evenly cooked that way? How can macaroni and cheese, one of her children's favorite dinners, be a side dish? Were the mashed potatoes not going to be seasoned with a little garlic and a lot of caramelized onions the way she likes them in Syria? From the day of arrival, writes Julia Moskin, food is an integral part of adjustment to a new country. 
On the U.S. State Department's list of things refugee sponsors must provide immediately is a culturally appropriate meal for a newly settled family. Some sponsors interpret this in religious terms and provide store-bought halal chicken or kosher pizza. But others take the responsibility more literally, going to great lengths to greet arrivals with home-cooked food that is specific to their place of origin, familiar and comforting. The Anjari family was greeted by their sponsor with a dinner of Syrian lamb stew and a kitchen stocked with ingredients from home. The Director of Immigrants Services in Connecticut called the culturally appropriate hot meal, quote, simply the best federal regulation of all time, <laughs> since so many refugees have gone years without a taste of home. Once settled, many new families tackle Thanksgiving, a holiday in the words of one refugee that celebrates new Americans as well as Native Americans and honors the practice of treating strangers with generosity and charity and humanity. Mayata Anjari made her first Thanksgiving meal her own, writes Julia Moskin. She approached the first turkey whole by starting with whole milk yogurt, grated onion, tomato paste, shards of cinnamon and nutmeg, turmeric and black pepper, and rubbed it all over the skin. She put the bird in the oven and covered it in foil. Finally, she toasted silvered almonds and clarified butter and scattered them over the bird for a rich, crunchy garnish. Working quickly by hand and without measuring, she mixed a batch of the butter-rich dough she uses for Syrian date-stuffed cookies. It would be used to line a pan for her first apple pie. She worked from memory since she had never seen a cookbook before coming to the U.S. Finally, the family sat down to taste the food surrounded by a crush of friends. As a cook, writes Moskin, Mayata Anjari understands both that making Thanksgiving dinner is part of the passage of American life and that mastering it will take time. <laughs> but this year, the appeal of sweet potatoes, even mashed with butter and salt, continued to elude her. <laughs> Next time, said Anjari, like many a Thanksgiving cook, I'll make them better. <laughs> I feel joy when I hear stories like these. I see the hand of God at work in stories like these. A hand that lifts the lowly, the lowly in life and the lowly in spirit. A hand of God that welcomes strangers and refugees, embraces everyone, and like Hannah long ago, brings joy in reversing states in life. Amen.